Роб, привет. Слышно? Hello, Vadim. Hey. Hello. Hey. Hello, guys. Hey. Oh, nice. <laughs> hey, George. Good to see you. Hello. <laughs> Me too. Yes. <laughs> nice. What's that? What's back? What's that background you got there? Uh, you know, it's uh, hard to say on English. R Russian подъезд. <laughs> как сказать? Радное. <laughs> Не, есть же слово, есть же слово. Как оно? Uh, just a minute, I'll take a translator for, for чего-то там. That's a great image. Absolutely. Entrance, just entrance, uh, maybe. If you go inside oh, the yeah. building, so it's, it's Russian yeah. entrance, door, doorway. Beautiful. The <laughs> keeper of the birds lives there. Like the shaman lives there. Uh, yes, yes, yes. And alcoholics. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that's what that's what the shamans have to do these days. Although, with this crisis, I think all the shamans are really happy now. I mean, mm -hmm. calming down. Yeah. Let's rest. I can live with it. Yes, I, yes. This is fantastic. So how, how, how are you? How is the situation? You are in Belgium now? I'm in Belgium. So, um, mm -hmm. yes, well, I think here the situation, um, um, well, we learned a lot from China, of course, and mm -hmm. from, from what happened in Italy. And mm -hmm. that really scared, um, um, yeah, the, the Belgian virologists. And so, for I think for about three weeks now, we are in this kind of semi-lockdown situation, and um, it's working. Sort of these numbers of, um, the, of of death and die people are are, are going down. There's mm -hmm. less uh, contaminated, but of course we are not testing. So. Unless we start testing, we actually will have real, um, real results. But mm -hmm. um, the people are, are extremely um, disciplined and compliant. So we are um, just taking the distance, and it's uh, it's a very strange. I mean, philosophically, it's a very interesting situation. Yes, uh, and um, and of course it's it's uh, ah there's David. Hello, David. So pe people became more more close. Uh, and David just подключается to the I mean, in this situation that everybody are separated, people became closer. So yes, uh, how to say in 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 cultural or uh, just social maybe things. Understanding, I mean, this problem so make people closer. Yes, together. Well, I think uh, we see two. Um, in Belgium, also all across Europe, we see two uh, trends, basically. Indeed, on the one hand, massive solidarity between mm. um, people locally, people doing shopping, um, yes. putting teddy bears in front of a window so the children can have a goal when they go out and spot the teddy bears. Um, sometimes there's this spontaneous clapping in the, of people uh, for the healthcare workers and the people in the supermarket, um, so that's a that's a that's a very positive thing, and we hope some of these things will last. 
On the other hand, in, I think we have like a 15 uh, 15% of all our school children in very, I think, rich countries like Belgium and Holland uh, mm -hmm. have no real capacity to do their homework at school. We find now that they were always in libraries and um, outside doing Wi-Fi and connecting. So this means that um, up to 10 to 15 percent of these children cannot be really reached in their homes. We also see a rise in domestic violence all across uh, the world, mm. I can say, but all across Europe as well. Um, and so I think uh, this is really forcing us to also have a look at our society, right? So we see a lot of people that are used to go out, work a lot, to buy a lot of things and have a nice home, put them in their nice homes. And now that they are forced to stay in their homes for only three weeks, um, they get burned out because they have to, have to sort of stay mm -hmm. home. I mean, what does this say about mm -hmm. the resilience of our, our minds in, in a society like that, where people cannot uh, not just stay, abstain from, from these mm -hmm. things for a few weeks? Uh, and probably have no real education in their own minds to be happy with themselves in their minds for a few. Uh, so I think this uh, this says a lot about um, about um, that we need education in philosophy, in literature, in the arts, in in in, in teaching people about uh, being more happy with their minds and not with so much stuff. Now, saying that, of course. We also have huge problems with um, with businesses. It's, it's, um, for example, friends of mine, they, they have like a chain of hairdressers. And, um, and now they have like 24 and already 14 will not open after one or two months. So it means that, that a lot of these small businesses have very, very little savings, very little. And this is Holland and Belgium and France we are talking about. We're not talking about places in the world where so I say all the structural problems in our neoliberal capitalistic societies I would say are being foregrounded to the extreme and mm -hmm. um, as an observer I, I find that I find that a, a very interesting and in a way good I'm not saying uh, abstaining from all the suffering and misery that's happening but it forces, forces us to take a good look at our everyday practices. Online practices, digital. <laughs> this is now, of course, that, uh, that we have what we have to, um, uh, to do. So, no, it, very really, it's a, it's a lot yeah. of problem. I think right now we can see uh, a, a lot of uh, problem in economy at first. So we see that our system is not so stable. It has no good stability, no no good backgrounds. No, and that's why I'm, I'm happy that as we, just, we have David on the call, David Lee, because I think that what we see is that uh, in um, in a let's say, cybernetic society in a, in a society which is hybrid, where we have analog, digital and connectivity and where we have uh, Internet of Things, AI, DLT. In such a world, a system like the Chinese system, which centralizes infrastructure, um, uh, has actually the best cards to deal with a situation like that and I think is, is, is stable, much more stable than our, our societies at the moment. That, of course, comes with, but that's my personal opinion, and of course, is that, of course, in the Chinese version of centralizing infrastructure, services, applications, and also, let's say, data management and privacy, all these things, that there, of course, there has to become a more a trajectory towards decentralization, a more opening up of these, of these layers, so that there is more air in the system, and... Um, but in, in our uh, particular uh, world, at this moment in time, uh, we run the, the risk of basically getting a full breakdown of the system um, because our, our governments are not able to centralize at any of these infrastructural uh, points at all. 
So we've these that we've basically privatized all the, the, the systems and all the building blocks in the systems that we actually need now to function. So our governments have no agency at all at this moment. So I would say that we are far more prone to a particular breakdown than uh, a Chinese system at this moment. But maybe David, you would like to talk about how you experienced, uh, because you, you were at the, the heart of, of all of this. Uh. Hey, cool. Uh, well, so I'm right now based in Shanghai. And I think, well, I mean, the Chinese system is interesting. So it's not as monolithic or as top down as you think. So the, right now, I think uh, a lot of this, uh, <clears throat> but that's a very fluid uh, working relationship between the local and central. And a lot of decision is made by local. Uh, every city decided how they are going to implement their quarantine, uh, what kind of resource they are going to make available, what's the essential service. Uh, kind of like the U.S. right now, but a little bit more coherence. Um, and as far as the, and one thing I think is more suited to the discussion here uh, is the intervention of IT uh, into the, into right now. So I know all you guys are now locked down at home. So we are about four weeks ahead of you. Uh, we just, we just get out of lockdown uh, two weeks ago. Uh, the, it, it is a very interesting is the, right now, if we go out to Shanghai street, uh, they are packed with people. And when I show that picture right now, everybody looks scared. Everybody's like, how can you have so many people on the street? It's dangerous. Come on, get them back home. But the, the, the reality is the, we are what you guys are going to look like in two to four weeks. Uh, and one thing of that is the, right now, after a long period of lockdown, uh, people has the mind going back into the crowd. Uh, that's actually a, a, a pretty scary uh, things to do. And I think one of the intervention uh, happened here is what is the, the health call. Uh, the health call implementation uh, has a lot of misinterpretation. Uh, the first is the, it's not implemented by, it's not implemented or owned by companies. Even though they manifest into two of the most popular application in China, which is WeChat or Alipay. But the, they are just, a, both of the app uh, has the ability to support third party. So that's the, they are not owned by the, they're not owned by the, the, the corporation. Uh, they are not owned by the central government either. Uh, they are actually owned by, I'm in Shanghai. So my health code is actually part of this uh, e-government cloud implemented by the Shanghai cities. And so right now we're actually in the, in the very interesting stage. If every city implement their health code. So right now all the city is trying to figure out how they are going to confederate the data. So now I can travel to the next city, show them that use the same code. Uh, and that code is now being checked in a lot of public area. If I want to go into a mall, I want to go into an office building, uh, the health code is checked. Uh, it might sound big brothers, but as individual coming out of this lockdown is the knowing everyone coming into the same space as you has been checked. Uh, there's a certain level of comfort and confidence. So I think uh, a lot of this and the, of course, you see a lot of other IoT usage. Uh, well, the, uh, right now a lot of building has equipped with the uh, temperature checking uh, facial recognition. Thing. Um, as horrible as it sounds, uh, I don't think they really, I don't think the guard is really looking at the screen, but somehow seem somehow, and 
interesting if you if you look at the implementation in China. Uh, when they do that facial recognition, the screen is actually facing the user, not the guard. Um, and somehow the, the, the visual of the passing by that screen and along with everybody else and having that screen showing things like, well, everybody has a normal temperature. Uh, that's, uh, no, that's also part of the reassurance of the, uh, the, the comfort and safety. So I think um, that's, that's a lot of this message is not been well conveyed uh, out because every single one of the implementation in the media is being written as this scary 1984 authoritarian dystopian nightmare. But in reality is the, a lot of this implementation of technology uh, actually help the, the post lockdown trauma uh, and helping people to get back into the uh, public space in a much uh, easier and comfortable way. So yeah, so I think um, it, it, it's worth thinking how this kind of things uh, can be, it, it's about the, the healing powers of this technology and how do they get transplanted and implemented in different cultural and different settings. Uh, it's probably a, a, a good challenge. And on the other side, it's also a very good opportunity uh, for a lot of the uh, group and entrepreneurs. I saw that somebody was raising their hand, I think, at some point. I'm not sure. It's, um, anyone wants to to reply uh, or to have uh, ideas to about what David just said? Or? Because I, um, because the story that we have is that we basically knew, because we know each other for a long time, I was uh, in Shanghai, I think, um, 10 years ago, or maybe more, visiting your first uh, hack lab, where you had the first hack lab in, uh, in Shanghai. And, um, and then sort of, I think it was March 12th that um, you mailed, that you, would, you had seen someone in Italy passing a note, some, uh, some citizen who was able to leave their, um, their homes. Um, and, um, and he said, this has to be done with a QR code. So we immediately set up a team and um, we, um, I think I can, let's see if I can sort of also post it in the chat. Uh, I think I can find it quickly. We set up, um, um, a team and now basically we have a proposal and we may also have a first a client very uh, very soon we will hear this in a few days which will be a major client um, because because we we have different um, um, different settings and we have different um, expectations of, of societies about technology at the moment and, and um, I'm fully with you that I always have seen and always see Internet of Things and this kind of cybernetics as a supporting infrastructure for people, animals, machines, and the planet. To me, it's logical that we go to some kind of a data-driven governance, and we need this data-driven governance. We cannot continue, uh, as we see now also in how this uh, crisis has been handled in, in the UK, in, in like lots of places in, in America. We cannot have like, like uh, people coming from the Middle Ages, I would say, or people that have, that are based on greed and ego and all this, all these characteristics, actually in the, at the head of the system at the moment. We need something else. We need a data-driven governance, a data-driven layer. So in, what we see now happening is that if you check the Twitter um, account for ID2020, which is like the, 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 the scheme of the United Nations, together with Microsoft Bill Gates, to roll out ID for everyone. Um, this has become a mass, massive nightmare, not only for Microsoft and Bill Gates, because it's been tied into vaccines and 5G, but it's, it's also has led now to burning masks, the 5G masks in 
So we're facing a massive, massive, in the West, in Europe, we have a massive distrust of people in these technologies. And if they see their smartphones as devices purely as tracking machines, uh, which may not be the case, but it's difficult to bring this positive message now, um, we miss the mark completely and people will have two or three phones and they will simply have a, a, a health code ID uh, on, on one phone and leave the other phones at home or something like that. So that is, um, so what we have, have, have planned, and this is something that we have been doing for quite some time now, our ideas are that, first of all, it's essential that we go to self-sovereign identity. So if we want to build a backbone for privacy by design, we cannot build it on issuing credentials from governments or from companies. So it has to, we have to have self-sovereign identity. That's number one. And this is what we are now implementing. But then, from this self-sovereign identity, we propose that you can spin off as a citizen hundreds of identities, temporary identities, specific for one purpose or specific for 50 minutes or one time or one service. Pseudonymity, this is. It's not full anonymity. But it's from this disposable identity. In the end, there is some kind of smart contract. It could be, for example, a smart contract that I make, make with the city uh, of Ghent, where I live, and say, okay, I think it's very good what you're doing to build this kind of situation where we have this um, tracking and tracing of, 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 of patients and immune patients like in the city. And I give you, I grant you the rights to do that for 15 days and under these and these and these conditions. And, and that's the kind of contract. That contract, I can always prove ownership over that contract, but that contract can basically not be tuned, can be locked down back to me. Of course, under particular circumstances in the legal system, it always is possible that some legal instance sort of forces me to hand over my private keys. So that's the first thing that we have, are building, a situation where we build self sovereign identity from a private key, it's purely your identity. From that identity, you have disposable identities. And now, this is fully GDPR compliant also. This is fully compliant with the, with the European law. Now, what we see is that certain nations at the moment in Europe are, in, are breaching this law because they need quick and, quick and dirty, fast patches because of this crisis. And we don't want to help them with that. Because also, as David um, has been telling us, this is going to be two years, only this crisis. Uh, November, December, there's going to be probably another wave. And so we are making a, a solution for a post-corona reality, post-COVID now reality, post-first wave. So we have, we're building a mobile SDK, a backbone, fully cryptographically um, uh, foolproof, on which app developers can then build their apps. So that's the kind of, that's the, that's the thing that we, we are doing now because we think that, um, um, although I personally think that, um, that, that China, because the politicians were engineers and are engineers, have, the, have had and still have the only realistic and possible um, politics for this type of situation, which we don't have in Europe. Again, our politicians and our commission has no agency, basically, because they have no no real power over any of the building blocks that they need to have power over. And especially in Europe, of course, we've lost data, we've lost the platforms. If we lose AI, we basically might somehow, might sort of, um... so we're also working hard to make sure that, that we own this architectural backbone that citizens will want to have their applications and services ported to. That's our main chance here. And um, so what I see happening is, is um, is uh, a lot of uh, exchange between 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 our um, solutions and the Chinese solutions, hopefully also Russian solutions, um, that um, that have a good balance between the collective and the, and the individual and the communal and um, uh, from a lo and, and from a local um, uh, local perspective. So. Um, yeah, I think I'm, I'm very happy to, that you reached out, David, and um, because of you, we now have this um, massive project going, and we're talking to 
uh, European blockchains, Alastria is joining, uh, Yota is, is interested. Uh, we have uh, a lot of um, a lot of very very good conversations from with uh, people that actually think that they can use our identity um, scheme, which is um, underlined by a protocol called Zenroom, which is Zenroom.org, which is the code written by Jaromil from Dynog, uh, which uh, is is for a part building on the coconut credential scheme. Um, that uh, Libra from Facebook is also using. So in the Decode project, the European project, the UCL team from London, from George Sanesis, was bought or acquired by Facebook to do Libra, and they're now all doing Libra in Tel Aviv. And in the Decode project, Jaromil was the other developer uh, from Dynog, and he built his Zen room on top of the same, in the same, um, the same type of cryptographic model that the Libra sort of ported to. So that's, that's I would say, a commercial validation of the protocol. And what we are now doing is we have top crypto cryptographers working with Yaromil and top SDK builders to, to turn this into a mobile SDK, which, which we need two months for, and um, to build it well and slowly. So in about two to three months, we'll have that SDK you can be, it, it will run, uh, you can get it in the Android store or in, and we'll also have to make a version for the, for the Apple. Um, so basically all this theoretical work that we thought had a roadmap of years uh, because we thought it was, it was um, unacceptable in certain situations to actually think in this, these terms, also from a political point of view, has become very realistic also because in our team, it's not only people from the Dutch police or from the Belgian security services, but we have the entire range of security forces, intelligence, and the hackers basically in, in one, 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 one team because they all have uh, the similar goal to build a good backbone for IoT, AI, DLT that citizens will trust and because they will only spend money, they will only do business in a trustworthy environment. So it's, it's not, a, it's not a, this type of thinking of disposable identities that may seem a bit, um, a bit semi-anarchistic or sort of all that. It's just common sense now. It's just, it's just good business sense. Not only that, it's purely legally sound. It's fully 100% GDPR compliant. So we are just following the law, which I find amazing. Which is, 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 I think, the, something that we really can work on together. So I really hope that we get some Russian teams and Russian coders on, on our project, that uh, they will look into uh, zenroom.org, that we have Chinese developers looking into zenroom, and that we, um, we can build this kind of, um, uh, together with the authorities and together with, uh, with the people, with the privacy activists, uh, we can build this uh, this kind of this backbone that uh, that helps us in Europe to gradually become a more centralized infrastructure, and that may help the Ch in the Chinese situation to gradually open up certain layers in the cyber cybernetic architecture, because as we all know, there needs to be. If, if there's too much stasis in the system, the system is becoming unstable. So the system needs, needs flow. And this flow needs also to be built um, on, on, on an infrastructure. If we own the infrastructure, if we own the basic um, cryptographic um, um, trust as deep as we can embed it in the code, and the next step, of course, is going on the chip to embed all of this on the chip as Zenroom. Zenroom is a virtual machine that, can, that basically is its own OS. So what it does is cryptographic interoperability. And so what we see is that if we can embed Zenroom in chips, in routers and applications and phones, we get a provable computing triangle. So Dino, we, with Dino, we build our own router, which is called DAOs.au, which is 
uh, we take over the DHCP and basically get, get, get ev see everything that's happening in the local area network. Um, we can embed the uh, run ten room on a chip. We can put that chip in a phone, and then the next step is that we build an ecology of of, um, of appliance makers uh, and say, look, if you embed our chips, um, you have this, you become part of this provable computing triangle. And then the next step is once we have this provable computing triangle, you can attribute, you can onboard any object or person attribute based only. So that's the beauty of the system. So when you onboard objects and people, they don't and will not be visible full in a kind of full light for, um, for the entire system, but, um, but only as, as, uh, as attributes, of course. Then you may want to disclose much more about yourself because you get more services. All good. And that's then the, the I think the trade-off that we um, we have to give the citizens in this new environment. Again, to me, it's just plain common sense. If people get the idea, like they're getting now in the UK with the burning 5G masts, that this is uh, something that is uh, against them, it's not a viable environment. We basically break our own system. So if people turn away from their devices because they will see them only as tracking. Uh, and tracing applications, and they don't feel that they have some agency in there. Um, this will backfire uh, tremendously on um, on what we aim to do, which is we want to build a, a fully uh, hybrid, um, uh, connected uh, society. And, um, so, yeah, I think it would be fantastic if we could um, work together, because also for me. This, this is really, um, really, really uh, important. It's a, it's a global um, infrastructure that we need to build. And I think, of course, I'm very happy also that in Europe now, there is um, no longer also this monolithic view on China as that you were describing, David, from this kind of author, that people are actually seeing sort of all the good things that, that come with, this, with these forms of services and application. And so that we must use this moment to, um, to, 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 to talk about the positive ways of data driven governance and not have the negative take over. Sorry for my long, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I'm just talking. So. So Rob, do you have any uh, some how cooperation with Silicon Valley or with United States companies, or it's just Europe and, and maybe some Chinese people also involved? Um, no, I, I cannot really disclose much at this moment because it's all all, all conversation. Uh, because um, because again, this uh, disposable identity idea and this notion of identity was, was worked out in this next generation internet forward. Uh, project from the European Commission. It was basically workshops. I have like 120 identity sort of professionals on list. We were doing workshops discussing all these things. And we had a roadmap of about six months or a year or maybe two years. And the virus and David um, Cole um, kickstarted everything. So we now have a telegram. I'll, um, I'll uh, send you the link. And uh, in the telegram, uh, there's about 120 people now. Um, there's, um, uh, let me see, don't, 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 don't remember the screen. But it's about 120 people now in different groups. And, uh, and with this group, we, we actually then build the first proposal that we hope to get, uh, get information on soon we're building a second one we're building a third but just join the group and if you want and um, go to the groups and see what's happening there um, and but we have a small steering group and um, with that group 
So the first idea for us is indeed to get buy-in from Europe. There's the EPSI, the European Blockchain Association Initiative. They are working on their own roadmap for building verifiable claims and verifiable credentials that we don't want to start issuing ourselves. So we set up a foundation. We will use these credentials and claims from, from trustworthy uh, institutions. And, um, but yes, we reached out to other standard organizations, like very, very big ones. Um, and um, uh, there's, a, there's a, a strong interest because um, um, there's been a lot of talk about self-sovereign identity for the past 10 years. Uh, it's become really vital now because um, we all see how fast this world can actually move. So if I'm a citizen, I'm a spider in a web, if the web uh, from every endpoint from every service, from every application, can look back at me. The agency that this that this that this that this coordinated set of endpoints is having proactively on me as a person, and I'm a simple person. If you follow me three days, you know what I'll do for the rest of my life. If you if you follow me in the supermarket for two days, you know what I'll eat for five days. So for the rest of my life. So it's this is unfair. It's unfair to citizen that there's so much pro proactive capability. On, on any of the actors that was not given any of this uh, authority to do this because they moved from an analog world into a digital one without any discussion. Um, this unfairness will, uh, will kill this system. I'm pretty sure of it. It's throughout history, we've always seen systems that are imbalanced towards, let's say the majority of the population and there's still billions of people and there's a, just a few institutions and, and things, it's, it's not going to last. So if the people who are the input of the system do not feel that they have agency in the system, they will move away from that system. Now we see what that system is. It's a global interconnected system. A small cog in the, in the machine and everything is, 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 is going, going down. That's quite unacceptable. It's just, we're now all at home because of some virus going from somewhere. This is, is unacceptable. I mean, so this, this, this should not uh, should not happen. So we need we need to find ways to remedy it. Now we know that it cannot be remedied by the tools that we have now. Representative democracy has is dead. Has no say. Our politicians have no clue. They are not not up to this uh, to this task. So um, we must find new ways of of. Um, of building data decision driven systems, which is what the engineers and the scientists now must do together, which is what they have already been doing in China. So the, um, the, the most important thing there is that there's a buy-in for these for the system. And there will only be a buy-in if if I can if I uh, am assured that that in in this the, the backbone that, that runs in this thing is mine. That, that, that I issue the credentials for this, um, for my self sovereign identity in the form. And from this uh, self sovereign identity, I can decide to make relations that I can also decide to, to disclose. That is, I would say, really, this is, um, and so happily, like I said, police in Holland, security services in, in Belgium, the GDPR, they are working with us because they understand that. That, that this is not giving up power in any way. They're not giving up any power because they're not um, giving up any, any oversight at all. Um, but they are, they are they, they're using the last remnants of power in the old system to try to explain to people that are totally distrustworthy of any form of politics. This, we have a very populist um, understream in our societies. People are fed up with all these people who cannot even get masks to the people who need masks. We cannot even get ventilators to the people who need ventilators, who will now fly big F-16s uh, across uh, Belgium and Holland. Uh, and then we should be happy with that because they can patrol the borders. I mean, these, these machines cost more than, than, like one wing of such a machine is costing more than all the masks that they should have been, that they should have been able to build. Now all of us can see this nonsense. And we're fed up, we're fed up with that. So 
it's a very classical, serious uh, situation where if people become too fed up, we get bad anarchy and they simply go to the streets and, and, and sm start smashing things. Now that's not what we want. So we want people to, to, um, to actually believe in this supporting infrastructure. And so it's, it's, it's interesting that it's especially in security forces and police and intelligence that it's working with solutions like ours that may seem activist or that may seem like, um, like uh, pro-individual and against institutions. They understand it's not like that. They understand this is the only way that will save their institution. If people, if people do not feel comfortable and, and sure in and, and some having agency in using their phones, again, if they will only see them as tracking devices, they'll put them away. So where is our beautiful Internet of Things world then? Then, then we've we've really polluted our own uh, our own well, and um, and so that's that's now what that's that it's a it's a huge fight because a lot of the Western governments have started um, just contacting app agencies. We also had a meeting with one of these app agencies um, because one of our one of, of our potential clients was asking to, for us to do that and ask to ask these app agencies that we're going to build one of these solutions for the government. Um, but it was clear that there was no brain there. There was no reflexivity. They were just they just they just got a call, build it, and they know that at some point all their data will be de anonymized. They know it can be hacked. They know it's it's not a secure solution. But they will go ahead because they want to win the bid. So it's really unbelievable to me, even in such a situation, these agencies have no yeah, they have no, uh, they've got no brain, they've got no reflexive capacities to, to understand not that you better say no to such a bit if, if the government comes to you now with you want to make this quickly, you say no, I don't want to make it quickly, I'll make it for the next wave because it's the next wave coming in November and December, give us six months, we'll do something that actually makes everybody happy, governments, citizens and companies. And um, so that's what, what we're doing, and we're seeing a lot of these agencies just quickly building these solutions um, that, um, that will have as an effect only that people will, will see that these, are, that these are hacked, that these are sort of, and they will only foster more negativity around, um, around the devices and the infrastructure. So yes, I think, um, we are in a very uh, serious moment, especially, uh, especially in Europe. And I don't know all details about your projects, but you know, it was um, maybe last year, it was quite, um, say, popular, but nowadays I'm not, I didn't hear a lot about that. If you have some kind of the peer-to-peer -peer financial, how to say, tools, some like uh, based on blockchain or something like that because uh, i remember what in estonia they introduced some kind of the special identities for migrants and so on and they can use uh, this special identity to apply for peer-to-peer -peer financing support and uh, if some kind of these uh, tools exists or you heard about that if you feel what it could have a great potential for future development because the most important uh, point, not only the privacy, but more practical things like recovery plans and uh, making normal life and so on. I fully agree with you. And I think David has a lot of ideas there because he is always urging us and to think about this post-corona, um, these post-corona applications and, and ideas. So. Um, so David, do you know if there's any um, cooperation with Russian um, uh, developers or architects at this moment in, in China? Uh, <clears throat> well, I think whatever is going on here is really being watched. Uh, the, the, the practice, the... Uh, and I mean, so one thing about the... One, one thing we really learn gets, gets to learn a lot is how the epidemiology work. 
uh, during this kind of times. So that's the, they, they're always switching between uh, what's called the containment and mitigation. So yeah. right now, you guys, it, the lockdown is a mitigation. Yep. Because we have no idea who has it, who doesn't have it. So we locked down for two weeks. Uh, whoever got sick uh, probably has it. And then after this, it goes back to containment. Uh, and the court of containment is uh, really uh, what's called the uh, surveillance network. Uh, it's about people's movement, it's about who has meet, who has been where. And so Every government has a very, uh, has the basic same data set they can use. Yeah. Um, Singapore is probably has another, Singapore probably presented a much more open example to look at. Um, for every cases, yeah. uh, they release the data where they have been, uh, when, they are, when, they, when they are there. Uh, and then on your mobile phone, you can actually, grabbing the, your location uh, history uh, from the telecom and do a matching. So I think um, right now, I think um, there are a lot of agencies looking at the, how this gets implemented. Uh, these are not hard things to implement. No. I mean, a, a team of five, 10 programmers can easily crank this up uh, with the access to data. Uh, it's the idea is really, I think the important part is the, for the government side, they'll be like, well, this is the easiest way to implement it. We'll associate this with your number, with your yeah. phone, with your, uh, with your, 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 your SIM ID. Yeah. Um, but I think that's also the, 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 the voice of the, how this can be uh, implemented from bottom up. Yeah. Uh, as an alternative to be able to uh, achieving the goal of the public health, uh, as well as the uh, the privacy protections, um, and it it this this I think will have extended to the next generation in terms of the yeah. uh, how we develop IoT. Uh, we are grabbing a lot of information. Are uh, they being centralized? Uh, to be processed by uh, one big server, yeah. or are they being grabbed into the local and just processed uh, locally? So I think this is interesting times to have a voice. Uh, to to at at this when it comes down to the uh, discussion of privacy versus public health, uh, there is a viable alternative. Um, otherwise, the Otherwise, the and I think this kind of this kind of uh, power. Uh, I mean, a lot of time I have this discussion with people. Uh, people is like, "Oh my God, the government is going to expanding their 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 surveillance capacity during this time." Uh, aren't you worry about this in China? I said, "No, because the we 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 deal with the government who already have the data." Do have all the data already. Uh, they can they can get this implemented in one week. Uh, we don't really worry. They don't really need to worry about this capacity get taken away. Uh, but on the other side is the for people in more democratic society, it is very hard for the governments to be able to pass in anything like this. Uh, once that's uh, that power is given, uh, it's very hard to get back. So I think that's also a very, very, that's also as the, so, I mean, for us, the life, the, 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 the lifestyle doesn't change much. Uh, I mean, living in China, you, one thing we assume is the government has all the data. So whatever they can do with the data, good for them. Uh, but you don't make the same assumption living in other countries. No, but it's, I think it's, I think it's actually the same anyway, sort of in a way. But, but I think you're totally right. And I think one thing that you said was very important, that it's these phases, right? So it's not but it's this, this kind of um, um, making sure that, that you have, that you check people that, are so, that's only very interested in, in, in a certain phase, not in the medication phase, but in the, in the opening up phase. 
And I think that's very important because that's also something to, to talk to citizens or, or sell to citizens and say, look, this is a temporary measure. Within this two or three months, we need this information and we can ensure that after two or three months, we will delete it or not use it. So I think just breaking it down into these phases, I think is very important. Yeah, but, uh, but I think the, I mean, if you look at the process of how this gets enabled in China, yeah. is that actually war between uh, different organizations. Yeah. So the telecom, they don't, I mean, uh, if you look at China, because we're dealing with a lot of the uh, large country-owned organizations, yeah. so uh, the Shanghai the government actually don't typically have the, our uh, mobile phone information. Because if you look at the organization in China, uh, the, 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 the China Mobile is a national government-owned, state-owned enterprise. And Shanghai government is a local government. So the 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 government of Shanghai or oh, China Telecom actually outranked the mayor of Shanghai. So that was actually we actually have a, a, a new guideline published by the state council to temporarily enable Shanghai government to access our <laughs> data information. Um, well, I mean for China, it's it's well. One thing about having a one-party system is the, well, the 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 guideline was issued in one days, yeah. and but it also means they can take it back in one days. Yeah. Um, so I think that's that part of the, but I think coming back is to really rethinking about, uh, this is not, this is not just the, um, this is not just one time. Yeah. Uh, if we look at the past. Uh, 20 years, uh, we have six uh, global pandemic, uh, H1N1, which is uh, 2009, uh, MERS, uh, swine, uh, MERS, uh, I don't have the exact, so this is the last one. Uh, so the, this kind of threat is actually with us uh, all the time. So. Um, for people interested in learning more about this, uh, that's a very interesting uh, event. There, there's a very interesting conference uh, called Event 201. Uh, it was actually quite ironically, it was hosted last November uh, to look at the, to, to do a tabletop simulation among government and, co and large company uh, to look at, well, uh, emerging of a coronavirus respiratory disease. Wow. Um, but, but here, so it's called Event 201, but that, that, that's a very interesting uh, reason to the name because every year WT, w, uh, WHO uh, gets about 200 cases of potential outbreak. And so we really have these things in the background uh, the so this is an, a new infrastructure uh, would have to be put in. Uh, it's not just I, I don't think it's just temporary. I mean, for COVID nineteen, this is for the next twenty four months. Um, but after the twenty four months, well, I mean, by the circle we have right now, we are going to have another one in the decade. Um, so coming back to look at this is the this is a beginning of a conversation because it is very interesting. Is the if you think about the all the measurement used by uh, this pandemic control, it's exactly the same as 1913 Spanish flu. It's people quarantined at home. It's it's, it's a field hospital. It's exactly the same playbook. We are, we are doing this pandemic like the information revolution never happened. Yeah. Uh, so the, to really rethinking about this is hitting global. Yeah. And the next one uh, could be from China, could be from Africa, could be from uh, US, could be from anywhere. Uh, is, the, is that infrastructure, 
how we are going to build up that infrastructure uh, is going to be a very important discussion, not just for this one, but for the next decades. That's really very, sorry, sorry I'm jumping in. If, if somebody wants to kick me out, then kick me out. But um, I, was, I was also reading um, this book by uh, Tigun. It's called, This is Not a Program. I really urge everyone to, to, to get it. It's MIT Press, uh, Simeo text. And it, they talk about um, a, um, uh, a quote from Foucault. And Foucault is writing about the plague in uh, 13, some, like six, five, 600 years ago, because I was thinking about it, if you were saying, we are doing this pandemic like the Spanish flu sort of never happened. And Foucault talks about um, what this meant in relationship with uh, the leapers and the, the plague. So the leapers were banned. Banishment was, the, um, was the, what, what society did with the leapers. With the plague, it was control. So first the houses were turned into streets, into districts and things. And then um, every citizen was asked his name, was put in a large register. And then every citizen was assigned a window. So that's what the windows are basically for. Imagine every citizen was assigned a window in which he or she had to appear every morning when the inspectors were coming and making their rounds. And if you didn't appear at the window, you're probably in bed. And if you were in bed, you're probably ill. <laughs> and so you were, in, you were probably in, in trouble. And of course, this is now what we, we still have. We have the window, which is a smartphone. We have that window. So we are also checking in that window. And um, so that's indeed, I think, this, this is the goal for us, for all of us, to build uh, an infrastructure together um, with companies, governments, and citizens, um, where we're all happy and all trusting this kind of environment in which we then um, that we use for the next rounds. And um, so I think, uh, for me, it's very important also to hear, and this I think we should, we should take to our, also our politicians and our policymakers, who still have this idea that China is some, somehow this monolithic top-down uh, environment. And I think your story is so important because it shows that, that that's not the case. There is much more negotiation between all levels and between all kinds of uh, institutions, people and individuals and um, companies, governments and citizens. Um, that, then, that, that there is then, then what we think and that's very important. So, and this, I especially feel this also with European policymakers. They never went to China, they never were in Shenzhen, they never were in Shanghai. They have a very strange, um, this, this top-down monolithic view as if, and it's, it's very important that uh, I think we, we really learn well from, from the things that are, are happening there now, especially also with the temporary aspects. So that indeed, it's not that you say, look, okay, so now the government will track you forever, blah, blah, blah. No, this is, these are temporary measures um, that are basically helping you and supporting you towards, towards this situation. Actually, we, uh, I think that's another side to be taken into account uh, outside of here uh, is corporations. Um, because, I mean, in, in here we have a very obvious uh, big government, small corporation. I mean, we have small corporation like Alibaba. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, but the I mean, compared to the government, it's small. Uh, but the it, it's exactly the other way around. So the the the, the, the other issue, if this kind of the uh, right now we. Right now, because the, the fear is the best ways to advance everything. Um, if you look at the, if you think about the, uh, when the government cannot do it, uh, this is going to be privatized. So one of the things, and this is, I mean, in the middle of this, uh, Google has just published a report. Uh, it's called the, uh, 
it's basically using all the data, the location data they collect, yeah. about billions of mobile phone running Android, and to compile the movement, the, the, the decline of the movement, and how, how successful the lockdowns of every, uh, every, every regions uh, are. Uh, it's a very interesting and scary report because this is the this is the part of the things we all know Google are collecting, uh, but then kind of people don't talk about this. So the other part of it is the to having that uh, that to have the 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 conversation about the same kind of things can be achieved. Uh, without the private company intervening uh, or government intervening or to a reasonable bond. Um, otherwise, the uh, another trajectory is, is really looking to just get outsourced to Google or Facebook uh, or Apple. Uh, I think the, um, the yeah, in the middle of all this, I mean, if Google published the same report from pulling the historical movement of the data from a billion mobile phone. If it's a month ago, that would be article trying to crucify Google. Yeah. Right now people are like, oh cool, my country is better, my, my, my country's <laughs> lockdown is better than the other guys. Look at this. Yeah. Uh, so I think the, yeah, I think for IoT is going to be playing a much bigger role uh, after this. Uh, it's really, it's a very terrific tool uh, for the, I mean, it has this good bright side and the dark side. And of course the bright side is the, it's something going to help us to get back to normal. Uh, and the dark side is the, uh, people are going to be willing to trade in their uh, private data. Uh, for a piece of the, for peace of mind, uh, for peace of comfort, uh, and whether or not who's going to own the data and how much agency uh, you have over the data. And I think one thing to look at, one thing to 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 look at, uh, in, we are at a very interesting time, uh, is look at what has been implemented in China, what has worked. Uh, but we, we live under very different assumptions uh, in terms of this relationship between uh, citizen and government, uh, people and big corporation and government and corporation. Um, so, but the intervening of the technology uh, will have to happen. Uh, otherwise, uh, when the next pandemic comes, um, I mean, we are going to deal, in, well, I mean, the scary part is the, the next time we are going to deal in with pandemic, it's actually this November. Um, now it, might not, it might not have an outbreak, but this is something we have to face uh, with no vaccine, with the uh, virus become active again. Um, but I mean, a decade down the road, uh, there could be another one. We never know when, where it's going to happen. And then if we go through this and in 2030, we still deal with the pandemic that is 1913, uh, that would be ridiculous. It's basically yeah. still like the entire internet didn't happen. Yeah. Yeah. All right, uh, I have to run uh, with the chat. Uh, but I mean, let's keep on the conversations. Yes, and I think that's that's going to be a lot of the um, a lot of the interesting application and opportunity of IoT uh, to could come out of this. Yeah. Thank I you very also, much. Yeah. We'll be in touch with you. Yeah. Yes. I hope hey. that um, yeah, I hope that um, that we can build some bridges between the World Public Forum with Andre in Moscow and uh, the Open Innovation Lab in Shenzhen. And sure. uh, because there's Andre and, and uh, the whole team, as Ivadim, as Nikita, Nikita, they're like every, sort of the whole team is, uh, um, yeah, very keen also uh, to get collaboration going. So that would be fantastic. Thank
Thanks a lot, David. Thank Thanks you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Uh, colleagues, uh, uh, thank you first of all for this conversation. Uh, Andrew, my friend, thank you for the invitation. Uh, I'd like uh, to say uh, a few words uh, about um, uh, David's speech. Uh, I'm, I'm not fully agree with him that there is a different approach to uh, collecting and exchanging data between private sector and government in uh, China or in European countries or, for example, in Russia. Uh, it might be only difference is how it looks like, but uh, in the basis, data is collected. Uh, all the companies uh, are gathering data and transfer them to the political uh, uh, and government institutions and so on and so on. So, uh, I uh, assume that every data about me is constantly coll collected and it doesn't matter uh, how it calls in Russians me or any Chinese me or Europeans me. I don't believe that uh, uh, di digital uh, digital rights or digital independence uh, is exist in the modern world. So we just need uh, to live with it and to build some uh, uh, above government structures, just just only to try to um, make a view that we can control it, because we can never control it, because uh, data now uh, is everywhere. But um, what this uh, situation with uh, COVID uh, COVID nineteen uh, is uh, uh, really presented. Uh, the situation is presented that the world is not uh, interconnected, that the world really is disconnected, as my point of view. And, um, uh, bu uh, and building uh, infrastructure, as David said, and uh, uh, Robert von Kronenberg said, it's really critical. And Uh, is a function of the world because uh, politicians are trying to get more and more scores on this situation, not to solve the problem. Uh, and uh, we should really transfer solution to engineers and uh, as association like. Uh, uh, IoT and uh, association like dialogue of civilization and so on uh, really must help to build such uh, such institution for engineers because uh, politicians uh, uh, show that they are fully uh, uh, they are not ready to the situation they are not ready to uh, to collect to collect data, they are not ready to share the data. They are not to try this. It's also, and it's also not, most sometimes not not really their fault. Also, because they were not educated. So it's not a negative thing when you're saying that. educated. Yeah. It's just a, a different world. So do better engineers. They build the systems. Yeah. Right? So, yeah, I fully yeah. agree with you. I fully agree with you, and I think also that, especially also Andre and, and, and the Internet of Things, Russia, and the world and the World Public Forum, dialogue, civilizations, uh, of course, also with um, with uh, what with the chairs to to to, to push this uh, this idea that is the idea is coming down. Yes, sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Yeah, so engineering approach is yeah it's uh, really key to success and uh, let me shortly introduce myself i'm uh, from moscow government i'm ceo of uh, smart city lab uh, it's uh, innovation laboratory to uh, test and then to implement in, uh, in implement infrastructure decision in uh, every day of moscow and uh, every day of citizens so we don't build a lot like uh, uh, a high-end solution and so on, so on. We just implement uh, already existed uh, technology uh, into into the life to make uh, 
uh, some social impact, to make some economic impact uh, in uh, every day of Moscovites. Uh, so uh, I have a lot of in connections in uh, Moscow authorities and uh, Russia authorities, which is a close connect to IT departments, uh, to uh, venture companies uh, like uh, uh, Skolkova and so on. So uh, if uh, you need uh, me or Andrew Filipov to be like uh, a bridge between you uh, or some uh, political institutions, some companies and so on, so on, please contact me. Uh, I will deliver all my all my contacts. Uh, might be in chat, maybe be uh, afterwards uh, uh, in uh, in our in our group and WhatsApp. So uh, I'm I'm in touch, and please contact me anytime. Thank you very much. I think that's very kind, and and um, and yes, I'll definitely do that. And I will also do that with um, with Andre and to and um, Andre and and Andre. Yes, and then I will also make the link back to, to David uh, with you in Moscow and him in Shanghai and Shenzhen. Um, and um, uh, yes, I think it's, uh, this is, a, of course, it's a sad opportunity because people are dying and people are at home and people are losing businesses. And, and so, but, I, but apart from that, uh, like the Chinese proverb is saying, a catastrophe is always an opportunity. So this is this is uh, and and this is also uh, true. So I think it's also an opportunity to get more international collaboration, cooperation going between between places in Europe, in Russia, and 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 China, and and also depoliticize the the language of of the systems, um, but but look at what is really happening and look at the, at the level of services. And look at how people are being serviced apart from how politics is operating i think that's really um and of course we work with the politicians like again um i mean we cannot blame them for this situation they were taken by surprise like everyone else because of the speed of the internet and iot but um yeah, I think it does show that the Chinese situation where engine, like the last government had nine engineers and scientists out of 12 politicians, it does show that we need more engineers and scientists um, in decision-making structures. And then, of course, together with philosophers, because we need the philosophers and, uh, and psychologists. Um, but yes. I would love to watch uh, uh, it. Time and I believe we can organize something uh, additionally thank soon. You. And uh, I would like to thank you, Rob, especially for your kind support. Of course, for thank you, and thank you, Nikita. Uh, thank you, Vadim. In this George. Yes, yes, it was very. Lovely. Just once, one small yeah. word from my side. Yeah, I would, please. I would like to mention, uh, except for the engineers, yeah. it's very important to have. It of the of this road because we've got to have uh, all the smartphones yeah. and ID chips working uh, the meaning of philosophers and those who are, are working with ideas and people directly engineers they are working yeah. with stuff they are working with but nowadays it's very between people so this philosophers all those uh, working together uh, on the conferences offline well uh, they should be involved in doing the same on to be more connected and is isolated in their uh, well apartments or well in some rooms uh, well the uh, internet of things and the internet to feel uh, everybody closer like i'm sitting in my apartment in one district of moscow andrew is sitting in his apartment in different uh, district well there was a guy from china but we experience yeah. it likewise yeah. like it's the same yeah. apartment in one city no thank you very much Nikita, and that's all 
uh, loved so much about the uh, art of the um, public forum and being in Moscow with the philosophy is um, now is the time to come with it because we, we, we know that what the Americans and what the Silicon Valley perspective is built just gadgets. Uh, it's, it's not really, uh, a system and, and, and so the, um, I think the, um, the Russian perspective on Internet of Things, uh, it should, that's indeed sort of, it should, it should it's mixed like a Mayakovsky, let's bring in Mayakovsky in, the, in, the, in, in IoT and, um, and, um, and the whole, uh, the whole perspective of a Russian thinking and philosophy that doesn't have this kind of Western, but it really is that, that, that has the, the kind of, um, yeah, that, that is totally different from any other part in the world, basically, which is this mix of, of, of narrative, technology, uh, sort of, yeah, how would you say it? Uh, like some kind of decency and dignity and of so that's um i think uh, uh this is a good moment also for the for the, um, the world public forum and it's in that, that sense and sort of in from the russian side i would say definitely Dim, if you would like to say something at the end. Thank you, Rob. Uh, and, um, you know, we will have another session, Zoom session, on the evening with approximately 50 people uh, involved. And uh, the, our topic now <coughs> is uh, uh, Death, Love and Robots. And uh, I, I have a question about uh, yes, connectivity and sex tech. Uh, maybe uh, you have a friends or friends of friends uh, with uh, such experience uh, with a distant uh, connections. Uh, yeah. Maybe virtual cyber sex or so on. It's a I saw that it's fantastic. Guarantee. Yes, it's fantastic, and this is also what I really love so much about the approach, your approach, because only a Russian could put one sentence like cyber sex, virtual cyber sex, and the next sentence cyber physical systems. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's sort of, this is exactly what we need. We we need to get away from this this horrible American Silicon Valley gadget, superficial nonsense, the transhumanist trap. Sort of, that this has nothing to do with real people, right? Sort of, we need to build real systems for real people. So we need to put some sand in that machine and, and build, it, build it much better. And that's, um, I'm so happy that you do that. And it's so important. And that now we need to show it more. We need to really get, Get, because the whole, the whole um, 10 years ago, uh, you were already talking about uh, bio AI um, inspired. That was already there. The vision that uh, you had with Fesha Arshinov was much broader, much better, much deeper than what we get now. Now, here in the West, and this English, this UK stuff, we, we really we disambiguated everything. We say blockchain, DLT, AI, da 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 da. It's all different chunks. It's no connection. There's no story. You have the story. You have the story. So I think you should be more, much more proactive and much more, um, much more um, arrogant, maybe sort of. But, but but pushing out that vision is way better than anything that we have now. Mike. I think you are muted, uh, Vadim. Uh, Vadim, you have to put on your mic. Uh, Andre, your last word. You are organizer of this session. 
We already done. Uh, thank you to all of us. Uh, see you soon, and uh, I wish you still health and uh, positive in this uh, yes. isolation time. Bye. Okay. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. 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 Thank Bye. You. Bye. Bye. Bye.